my video is started. Yay, this is ready? the beginning. <laughs> this is the signs of the beginning. Okay, it says we're live. Yay, Hi, we're live. Excellent. Good job. <laughs> It's it all like every week we have to jump through a different hoop to start a live video. I know, I know. It's kind of amazing. So, hey, everybody, welcome. And uh, this is Dulce Moon Talk number seven. Seven. This many fingers. We've been doing this, gosh, so for 14 weeks because we're doing one like every other week. Yeah. And it's pretty cool. Uh, your responses, by the way, are just really heartwarming. I love catching up on the chat afterwards and the replays and it's just really sweet to see what's happening here. Um, and uh, this morning, we're turning the tables. Erin May uh, interviewed <laughs> last time and now I'm interviewing her, which means we get to have a conversation about dulcimers. Right. And our, our love for dulcimers. So, uh, and Erin, you just got back from Winfield, right? I did. Yeah. I did back from Winfield. I mean, I got back on, well, um, my dear husband said, why don't I just come get you on Saturday whenever you're tired? So <laughs> we got home, I don't know, three in the morning on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Are you both not, uh, night owls? We are. We are okay, well, owls. that that explains yeah. that. <laughs> so he doesn't come out with you. Oh, he comes. He comes and goes. Um, the very first time that I brought him out to the festival, and then I sat in a jam session circle for I don't know four hours. Took a five minute potty break and went back for four more hours. He kind of looked at me and was like, "I don't think I'm." ever going to feel this intense about about music <laughs> i think this is your thing <laughs> <laughs> but it's been great because he is really good at doing things like making sure that i sleep sometime and take a shower <laughs> and eat some reasonably healthy food along the way because sometimes care tasks become less important when I have yes. the opportunity to play music for 12 or 14 or 24 hours. And Plus, you wait all year for this sort of thing. And in this case, you've been waiting three years. Yeah. Well, you did true. some last year, right? Yeah, there was kind of a scaled down version of the festival last year. And mm -hmm. we were, some, some of us were there and everybody was a lot more kind of cautious. And totally makes so sense. So this year really did feel like a uh returning in a big way and this was the 50th year for the walnut valley festival oh so how exciting festival yeah it was just very cool that's excellent so and your family was there yes my sister and my two nieces were there for the first time in many years i mean they, my nieces hadn't ever been there and my yeah. sister hadn't been there for a long time so it was really special for me i mean i think my winfield magic this year really was having my two-year-old niece, every morning when I rolled out of my tent, kind of bleary-eyed, my niece would go, Owen, wake up. Owen, play dulcimer. <laughs> and I'd be like, let me just make a cup of tea. And then, yes, we'll play dulcimer. I'll play dulcimer as much as you want. And, you know, playing dulcimer is usually like two-minute intervals in between drawing and coloring and fuzzy balls and bouncy balls and all the things that two-year-olds do. They're very busy and with short attention spans, but play dulcimer was always on the list, so. Well, that's exciting. That that event is on my, um, on my radar along with, gosh, I... Kentucky Music Week, one of these days, I'd love to go to Kentucky Music Week, because it seems like, I, I don't think I want to try to teach, I just want to like soak it in, right. you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you're going to miss something. Every time you go to something like that, you're going to miss well, something. Yeah, that's what I was really noticing this year, is like, this is a festival where you can do all the things all day and all night and miss so many things. Right. Right. You're just going to miss stuff because there's so many different things going on simultaneously, constantly. Mm -hmm. So Winfield kind of fits into your dulcimer journey, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. So um, my parents went 
uh, went to Winfield a couple times, um, I think when they were dating, like <laughs> before they were even married, they came to this festival a couple of times. And my dad really fell in love with bluegrass music. And when I was a baby, um, he got himself a mandolin and decided like that was going to be the thing he did after the babies finally went to sleep. Um, so my mom actually was the working parent. She's a physical therapist. Mm. And my dad was the stay at home parent. Aww. He was a teacher, uh, elementary school teacher by trade and physical therapists made a quite significant more money than elementary school teacher. And so my parents decided that they could have, they could have one of them stay at home if the one who stayed at home was my dad. And so he was the stay at home parent and playing mandolin was kind of his like, finally, I'm done with babies and I can do something for myself. <laughs> um, so I grew up with music all around me. And I remember going to music festivals and falling asleep on the ground at music festivals as some of my earliest memories. So uh, my parents were really uh, attuned to to getting us started with music. My sister is two years younger than me. And so piano lessons was like the obvious first thing to do. My dad was like, I really want you to have piano lessons because it'll give you a foundation for any other instrument that you want after that. So I started taking piano lessons when I was five. Um, but my sister, when she was two, became obsessed with fiddle and like wanted to play the fiddle so badly. And kept on saying, you know, a two-year-old's attention is short, right? We just talked about this. So when a two-year-old is like, fiddle, fiddle, and every day keeps saying, I want to play fiddle, my dad was finally like, okay, I got to find this kid a fiddle. So when she was four, he managed to find her a teacher and a fiddle. Um, and so... I started playing piano when I was five. She started playing fiddle when she was four. So I started piano first and then she started fiddle. And then we were going to bluegrass festivals and my dad was taking his mandolin and my sister now was taking her fiddle and I was learning piano, which didn't fit in the car. And so I started just wanting an instrument. <laughs> and my sister was like so obsessed with fiddle. It has to be fiddle. And I was like, I don't know what instrument. I don't know what instrument. <laughs> instrument my dad would like point out all the instruments in the circle do you like this one and I I I would just like shrug my shoulders I don't know which instrument I want and so my dad in his great wisdom was like well yeah this is never gonna stick then if she doesn't have anything picked out um, and so he went looking for the cheapest instrument he could find for a seven-year-old <laughs> And what he found was a mountain dulcimer at the music store in Concordia, Kansas, which had been ordered for a music teacher in the region because this is in the era of go to the music store and they open their catalog and you choose out of the catalog what you want and then the music store orders it in and then you come back to the music store to pick it up. Well, they ordered this mountain dulcimer for somebody and this person never came back to pick it up. And the people in the music store didn't really even know what it was, <laughs> except for, you know, the item number in the catalog that they had ordered it from. And so my dad is like, well, I'll give you 30 bucks for it. And they were like, sold. Here you go. Please take it off our hands. So I got a mountain dulcimer for my seventh birthday. <laughs> Without knowing any dulcimer players, any context, you know, a lot of people's dulcimer origin stories are, I heard this amazing, beautiful sound and it captivated me. And mm -hmm. mine is like, my dad found a super cheap mountain dulcimer. <laughs> but he had your best interests at heart. Definitely had my best interest at heart. And, you know, bless him. The only, the only person he'd ever heard of who played the mountain dulcimer was David Schnaufer. Ah. Because one night he happened to be watching PBS and there was like the, you know, PBS. Austin City Limits? Inter it wasn't Austin City Limits. It was an interlude. They did these little interludes. It right. was like, this is brought to you by, and there was something in the interlude. And the something in the interlude one night was David Schnaufer and the Cactus Brothers playing Fisher's Hornpipe. And my dad was like that's really cool and just kind of tucked that away in his brain 
<laughs> and so when he found a mountain dulcimer super cheap at a music store, he then looks in all of the music catalogs for anything with David Schnoffer's name on it. And so I got a David Schnoffer CD and a Sam Sisler CD who was a person from Alaska who had David Schnoffer record on a couple of tracks. It was really this obscure album, but that's that was my context then for Mountain Dulcimer. And then he started ordering me any books we could find. And this is where my dulcimer journey begins to actually intersect with some women because one of my first dulcimer books was Larson's Larkin. dulcimer book. Larkin Bryant. Yeah. yeah. And I, I never got to meet Larkin. Um, she passed away a couple years ago. And I know her husband now. Our paths have crossed several mm -hmm. times. But this dulcimer book is where I learned to strum. Because the first exercise in this book is different strumming rhythms for Boil Them Cabbage Down. Hmm. And, like, I still use the same strumming rhythms that I learned from Larkin's Dulcimer book. It was red fiddle sing sing, peppermint peppermint, and sing Mr. Mississippi. And, like, I oh, still use wonderful. patterns. Strum, yeah. strummy, 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 <laughs> strum, strummy, strummy, strummy. Wow. Right. Yeah. So you learn longs and shorts and different combinations on page 21 of the book. And the very first tune in the book is like on page 15. So it's, it's one of the first things you do. How do you hold the pick and then play go talent roadie mm -hmm. and then learn blow them cabbage down with these three strum patterns. So I learned how to strum from Larkin's dulcimer book. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and then a little while longer, I got Bonnie Carroll's Dust Off That Dulcimer and Dance Book. And this is actually my original copy. And it's like taped together and pages are falling out. And now I have like, I have the pristine copy that I found somewhere that I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this as the one that hasn't fallen apart yet. <laughs> so my Bonnie Carroll book is is dearly loved. And I've I've often said, I think that if you really want to understand the mountain dulcimer really thoroughly, this book does the job because she really walks through different modes and tunings in a really um, practical way, which I didn't understand at the time that I was going through it. <laughs> it I just made it. I just made a note. <laughs> yeah, it, it took several more times and explanations and, and ways of going through it, but I still go back and reference some of the ways she talked about. Mm -hmm. modes and tunings and learning tunes in different modes because it was laid out well i think okay yeah cool. Cool. so so mostly then f i was self-taught um because there weren't any dulcimer players in concordia kansas and i can remember meeting david schnoffer for the first time because he was at winfield at the walnut valley festival and um that year he gave me, I didn't pull that one down, but he gave me his Swing Nine Yards of Calico book and the cassette tape that accompanied it to learn from. And I still have that book. It's it's signed by him. Aww. Yeah. Really sweet. Really sweet moment where I, I actually got to meet him um, so when I was really young. For people who are uh, listening to this who don't know about David Schnaufer, which a lot of, you know, 21st century right. dulcimer players don't tell us a little bit there yeah well the dulcimer players news mm -hmm. magazine this this one has a great photo of david on the front cover which it's wonderful happy yeah um so david schnaufer played with a lot of the nashville country musicians and so right. he brought the dulcimer to he brought the dulcimer to my generation i mean he also was a great teacher and encourager of children. And so um, Sarah Elizabeth studied under him and Jeff Hames studied under him. And then I was kind of on the fringe of the dulcimer kids that studied under him because I never got to really spend a lot of time with him. But we ran into him at several festivals and I was deeply influenced by his music and teaching. But he really, I mean, he played the mountain dulcimer with other instruments. Right. And that was a huge thing because I was playing mountain dulcimer with other instruments. 
Yeah. Um, and that honestly is a gap that I feel like hasn't been filled super well since David passed away. Um, we, we, the Mountain Dulcimer players, tend to kind of hide in our own little community. And I am like, no, we work with every instrument. We got to jam with everyone. I love seeing Sarah Kate um, Morgan is doing a lot of playing with all the instruments. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yes. Dulcimers are compatible with every other stringed instrument. Right. They really are. You're both going to be at Black Mountain this year, right? Yeah. That's going to be fun. Yeah. 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 So the Black Mountain Festival. The banjo and fiddle players to join yeah. us. That's in October, right? In it's North in Carolina? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Towards the end of October. Okay. It's after the quarantine event. So. Right. Right. Um. So how long was it before you actually had a dulcimer teacher? So when I was about 12 ish, maybe 11, 12, somewhere in that range. Um, I'm, we met Jim Curley and Jim Curley lived in Kansas city, which was about a three and a half hour drive from Concordia. Oof. And he had a music store in Kansas city, which Dwayne Porterfield, I'll, I'll, also talks a, a lot about um, Jim Curley and the Mountain Music Shop because Dwayne Porterfield lived in Kansas City and Jim Curley was really instrumental in his becoming a Mountain Dulcimer player as well. Um, so he agreed that if we could get to Kansas City on Saturday mornings before the shop opened, so the shop opened at 10, so we could have a lesson, a Mountain Dulcimer lesson from Jim Curley between like eight and 10 in that window. Wow. So for about a year, anytime we had a free weekend, we would coordinate with him. And as soon as my mom got off work on Friday, my dad would have the car packed and we would drive three and a half hours to Kansas City and we would stay with a friend and we would get up early and go have a mountain dulcimer lesson from Jim Curley. And then we would drive home. Wow. <laughs> so my parents literally drove seven hours for me to get Mountain Dulcimer lessons from Jim Curley. Um, and those were the only Mountain Dulcimer specific lessons I ever had. Mm -hmm. Everything else was um, some workshops. And I actually, I found out that Mountain Dulcimer festivals and workshops were a thing that happened. So <clears throat> tucked all throughout Bonnie Carroll's book are pictures of dulcimer gatherings and I don't know if I'm going to be able to just flip to one but there were these pictures of here's one the first rabbit junction dulcimer festival and you see all these mountain dulcimer players yeah. in this picture and I looked at this book longingly and thought I wish I had been alive then when there were dulcimer gatherings <laughs> We had no idea it existed. We had no right. idea there was a community around this instrument at all. <laughs> and in 1999, when I was 12 years old, David Schnaufer came back to the Walnut Valley Festival with this guy no one had ever heard of named Stephen Seifert. <laughs> and Stephen Seifert befriended our family and started telling my parents, like, you guys really ought to go to some of these dulcimer festivals. There's one in Carthage, Missouri. That's not too far away from you. And there's the, these festivals in Texas. And what about Mountain View, Arkansas? And so he gave us, like, a list of festivals that are in the region. Mm -hmm. And we went to the one in Carthage, Missouri, First, it was at the Precious Moment Center, this little dulcimer <laughs> festival. Um, and it's, you know, it, I, it probably only happened six or seven years or something. It wasn't one of the really long standing festivals, mm -hmm. but one of those little regional festivals. It was the first dulcimer festival I ever went to. And um, from there, I started to get connected to like the dulcimer community and realize that this is a thing that does still exist. I am, I am alive in the right era. Yeah, yeah. I often tell uh, students who start with me in the past year or two, I say, welcome to the golden era of dulcimer education online. Mm -hmm. 
It really is. Yeah, there were just almost no resources. In, yeah, exactly. We in a place that already had a lot of dulcimer things happening. So we were talking about this before we worked through all the problems to get online this morning. Um, but you were looking and searching to see who the women in your dulcimer journey were. And aside from the book by Larkin Bryant and the one by Bonnie Carroll, you said there weren't many. It was pretty sparse. I yeah. didn't remember meeting Aubrey Atwater. Um, but one of the things that has been sort of critical for me is I have never identified as a singer. Right. Um, and especially when I was learning to play the dulcimer, especially through like high school and, and my early 20s, I really didn't sing. And I was pitchy i didn't have a good ear i like i've their recordings my parents were very generous they encouraged me to sing anyway like there are home recordings of me and my sister singing and like i was a nightmare at singing it, just was, <laughs> it was not good it's not even like wow i just didn't want to sing it was like i was not good at singing and we didn't know uh, really about things like voice lessons at that point being mm -hmm. an option it was there was kind of this inner belief that like either you're a singer and you it comes really naturally which my sister was she was always on pitch very much a natural singer very strong natural ear or you don't and i didn't and thus i wasn't a singer and i could not relate to women who were singers and when i think back on like the women who were influential in the in the dulcimer world in in that time like even aubrey i identify aubrey as a singer first and a dulcimer player second and i was a dulcimer player like that's it that was my whole thing um and i think about women in bluegrass claire lynch is is one of my very absolute favorite women in bluegrass i love everything claire lynch has ever ever done and i've loved her for a long time she's a singer and, and most of the women in bluegrass are singers first and their instrument is kind of their secondary thing. I mean, even Alison Krauss, who's an incredible musician, a really great fiddle player, is almost always presented and all of her recordings lead with her voice and not with her instrument. Yep. And so I actually felt like I couldn't relate to any of the women who were in the music circles that I was in because they were leading with their voices mm -hmm. and I just couldn't relate to that at all and so mm -hmm. basically all of my role models all of the musicians that I have tried to emulate have been men right right yeah so I was thinking about all of that and thinking, gosh, this work is so important. It is. It's so it is. important because I'm, it's not that women instrumentalists aren't out there. It's that women instrumentalists aren't as visible and they, right. they, they don't have the place in the band, but I, I was naming that, um, Bela Fleck did uh, his My Bluegrass Heart concert as the grand finale of the Walnut Valley Festival on stage one. And Sierra Hull kind of stole the show. And I was like, yes, get it, girl. Because she's really a player. And she's really a player first. She's a mandolin player. Mm -hmm. um, she sings too, but it hasn't been her voice that has led her into her career. It has been her mandolin playing. And I'm like, all right, we're getting some some instrumentalists showing up in the field and in a, I mean, she was in a circle of all men, totally surrounded yes. by men and she was holding her own just fine. How exciting that there was only one woman in the band and she wasn't the singer. Right. That's exciting. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's progress. And how sad that I have to say that, right? Right. Here I am in the San Francisco Bay Area, which people think of as, you know, a hotbed of culture. And we have been, perhaps we shall be again. Uh, <laughs> we keep going through tech, tech booms and busts. And honestly, the busts are good for culture because then it's not about all the tech bros. 
But uh-huh. um, it really upsets me when people I know form a band or even they have, you know, they do this gig with these people and that, that gig with those people. And I'm like, oh, I'm really excited. I really love this player. Who did they pull together? All guys. And, I, you know, I'm 70. I get to be cranky. <laughs> if there's no women in the band, I'm not going. I'm not supporting that. If you're doing solo, great. But if there's no women in the band, there's no excuse for that in the Bay Area at all. Um, so, and yeah, there's an amazing amount of fantastic um, talent in the folk music world. Come on, can't we like just think about what it looks like, how it feels, and what what are you guys missing? What are you missing? You don't even know. Mm-hmm. You don't even know. And um, yeah, for women to get a chance, it's really, it's really a thing. There's um, a TV show on right now. I think it's on Amazon, A League of Her Own. It's about the baseball uh, teams, the Women's Baseball League. And uh, the series is quite different from the movie, which was made about 30 years ago. And it is all about this, all about women getting a chance to do what they do best. Uh-huh. It's all about that and how, how crazy that struggle is. It's nuts. Yeah. I yeah. remember in, in college, um, one of my classmates was an electric guitar player. She was really good. And she struggled a lot with being known as the girl guitar player. She was like, I just want to be known as a really good guitar player. Like, I just, I don't want to be the really good girl guitar player. I want to be the really good guitar player. And I, I feel myself feeling the same way. Like, I don't want to be the girl who's good at the dulcimer. I just want to be a musician. And, like, for me, it's it's dulcimer and girl that both can be the, like, wow, you're really good for a dulcimer player or, like, you're really good for a girl. No, I don't want to be really good for a girl and I don't want to be really good for a dulcimer player. I want to be a musician. Like, I want to be a person who is musically able to hang with anyone like that's what i'm that's what i'm aiming for i have a long way to go but that's that's what i want and that's that's a personal goal as well and for that purpose you are one of my inspirations because you do just go for it and you know how to encourage people to go for it people who think they can't do it and that that helps inform my teaching with brand new students. It's like, you know, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that you haven't yet. Right. And, you know, I, I, I have jammed at Winfield every year for mm, as long as I've had a dulcimer. Right. And the first years, obviously, I was like playing. I played Wildwood Flower very slowly and that was my one song you know or i could play both of the cabbage down and liza jane and then like the jam must go on without me um but for the last 10 or 15 years i've jammed a lot out there and every single year you know i'll be sitting in a jam with people i've played with a lot over the years and then a couple of people who've never heard me before and there's always that moment of like whoa, I've never heard anyone do that on a dulcimer. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, part of it is because I'm just too stubborn to not try. Like, (laughs) I'm not necessarily great at playing a banjo tune in B, but I'm not going to walk away instead of trying. I'm going to play a solo that sucks and still (laughs) hang in, you know? I got into one jam where they were actually, they were like playing songs off of Bela Fleck Tales from the Acoustic Planet 2. Um, I told you I ran into a banjo player who had studied at Berklee School of Music in Boston. Right. So that was the jam I was in. And I was like, 
barely hanging on. I'm like hanging on for dear life, barely following the chord changes, barely keeping up at all. But I was not going to walk away from that. I need to learn how to play things that are hard for me, right? Right, right. I was like, oh, this is really hard. This is really hard. This is so cool. This is awesome. You know? <laughs> it's both I of need those to go things. Study. It's both of those things. That's, yeah. you know, um, at the uh, Zoomathon that we had, and uh, Karen Mueller uh, gave us a little video because she couldn't be there in person. And, and she used the phrase, dare to suck. Yeah. Yeah. Play that more. Karen Mueller said, in the spirit of dare to suck, I'm going to play this. I'm like, wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I do think that's how we explore territory outside of our existing comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we talked about how you got to the point of, of Winfield and fi well, finding the Dulcimer festivals and then eventually starting to go to Winfield and all of that stuff. When did you, I mean, you participated in the contest at Winfield, right? Yeah. So I, it started with Acoustic Kids. So Acoustic Kids is a program where you can you could audition in those days by cassette tape. Now you can, you know, take a little video on your phone and send it in and um, you get to play on the big stage. Mm -hmm. And so I, I played in Acoustic Kids. That's actually how I met David Schnaufer the first time because he came to Acoustic Kids and listened to me play. It was so sweet. sweet. Uh, yeah. I. I'm endeared to David forever and ever and ever because of that moment when I was really little and didn't know how to play hardly anything. Um, <clears throat> but then I started entering the contest and the first year I entered the contest, I was 13. And um, Steven Seaford actually was the one who said, you ought to just start entering the contest. You'll get used to what it feels like to be on stage. You'll you'll find your way, and then he claims he didn't say this, and of course this is how I remember it. So like, yeah, this is years and years ago. So how it how it exactly got said, I have no idea, but the essence was when you're good enough as a player to win the contest, you won't be nervous by be by the contest anymore because you will have had this experience of just trying it now. And I was like, okay. <laughs> This isn't really different than piano recitals. This is my dulcimer recital. But what was magic about it is that I met all these other dulcimer players. I mean, that's when I really started to meet other dulcimer players was backstage at the contest. And my, to this day, my favorite thing about the mountain dulcimer and hammer dulcimer contest is the camaraderie backstage. You just become friends with all of those other people. And it's like, oh my goodness, I'm not the only dulcimer player who's been practicing all year. There are other people who really love this instrument and have been practicing and working on it. So I entered for the first time when I was 13. I made the top five for the first time when I was 16. And then I won when I was 17 in 2004. That's great. That's and great. this year, I have to tell you, this year at the contest, the Wright family had three generations entered in the contest. I noticed that. It, uh, they had been talking about doing it, and I was like, oh my gosh, you guys have to do it. Elijah, what are you going to play? So he, Elijah is 11, and then Lloyd is his dad, and Lloyd won in 01 or 02, I think, and he won when he was 18 and then a couple years later i won when i was 17 so there's been a little internal rivalry rivalry between me and lloyd ever since <laughs> um and then it, lloyd's mom is margaret and right. she of course has been deeply instrumental in teaching like everyone in texas how to play the dulcimer yeah um yeah and bringing kids in too because she was an um, elementary music teacher and she brought mm. kids i can remember years at winfield where the wright family was like six kids and you were never really <laughs> sure which ones were actually Wright kids and which ones were friends of the family because they just <laughs> always brought a bunch of kids with instruments right so yeah right i got the opportunity to meet her um at the lanyap dulcimer fet in 2020, just before everything shut down. Mm 
Yeah. And, and it was, I was at lunch with her when she made the decision, yeah, I'm going to have to cancel old pal this year. She was really sad about it. Mm-hmm. And she said, it's in God's hands, right? Yep. 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 <laughs> it's like, that's Texas yeah. for you. <laughs> she could play everything. She can. She's yeah. a really well-rounded musician. Yeah. And, and shape note singing. She leads shape note singing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Their family is really precious. And and Stephen Seifert actually is the one that introduced me to their family. Yeah. 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 So she was sort of an extra dulcimer mom. Along the well, way. what do you have? What words of wisdom do you have with your lifelong experience? Which is different <laughs> from many of us. I mean, I have a lot of people who like discover it after 60 and uh, and they just, they pick it up because they've always wanted to play and or be a musician or have music in their lives and they really have no idea about this stuff. What would you have to say out of this whole journey that was the most, well, just what's your wisdom from all of this to uh, future players? Well, I think my my big thing that I will say over and over again until I'm dead is find the music that you like and play it. Nothing is off limits. I, I didn't learn from dulcimer players. I mean, I went back and learned old time music after I had been playing bluegrass and tunes out of the fiddler's fake book for years because I then discovered that was the roots of the mountain dulcimer. Right. I didn't learn any traditional mountain dulcimer styles until much later. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think it's important for us to know a name like you can play anything on any instrument. S- sometimes you just got to be willing to like stubbornly dig into it on your own a little bit. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and there are lots and lots and lots of resources for having your hand held through some of the traditions. And there are may, way fewer resources for having your hand held through learning mm-hmm. more like pigeonholed styles of music. Mm-hmm. But you can become a musician who plays the dulcimer and, and you can become a woman who is a musician and an instrumentalist and just do it because you love it. And yeah. That's enough. Plus, if you're playing music you love, you're more motivated to practice. You're more motivated to to arrange things. It's always that thing that that tune or song that I'm like, like you you were saying, the tune that you play late at night that sticks in your head, right? It's yeah. it's like, okay, I can't let go of this. It's not letting go of me. I guess I need to learn this. I need to figure out how to play it how to sing it, whatever it is. And that inspiration um, that we hold is what fuels us for those times of frustration and where we have to dig in a little harder to get what we're inspired to play. Right, right, exactly. Sometimes there there are tunes you learn that become stepping stones to what you really want to play that are part of that process, but. Yeah. I, I believe a lot in playing what you like, <laughs> whatever that is. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I wish you um, a, a speedy unpacking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, as I described to you earlier, my unpacking has been slowed down considerably by the fact that I turn on music and then sit down and learn the tune that I'm listening to <laughs> instead of unpacking, but I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks so much for making time for this, Erin May. I know people will really enjoy hearing your journey. It's a part of dulcimer history now, right? Yeah. And it's a part of 21st century dulcimer history. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited for the people who are picking up the dulcimer now. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Okay, hon. Well, hey, folks. So this is uh, Dulcimer Talk number seven. Check out the Dulcimer website. We're going to start picking up, um, making changes and adding things to it over the next few weeks. Our uh, fundraiser was quite successful. And thank you to all our donors. You're going to be getting uh, getting rewards and notes and stickers and love notes in the mail soon. And um, just thanks for being the Dulce Moon community that is growing. We're now 215 people in our group. 
keep telling your friends, keep letting them know that there is a, there is a movement to make more uh, visible representation of women leaders and teachers and artists in the dulcimer community, because we're already here. Yeah. Let's just let them know that we are. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yes. All right. Take care, Karen. Uh, Karen. I'm thinking Karen Mueller. Aaron. <laughs> what a, I must be tired. It must be time for another cup of coffee for me. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, folks. Dulce boon love. Bye-bye.